And why soon? There'll be just two kinds of people. Hi. Those who use computers. Yeah, I'll be home for breakfast. And those who use ap apples. just came from a great party that Apple threw. Let me tell you, what a bash. But you know, I think they have a problem remembering their name. They put it all over everything. It's very strange. But I've got good news. I met a guy, and I think it could work this time. Now, he's an accountant, and, and he still lives with his mom, so all right, he's a little bit nerdy, but I feel the vibes. It feels pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Enough about me. Let's talk about the promotion. Apple's really psyched about this, and you should be too. Why? Because you can make a lot of money during this promotion, and it's really easy. A California federal judge will soon render a verdict which can potentially change how we download apps to our smartphones and other devices. The popular video game Fortnite was eliminated from Apple and Google's app stores last year after it tried to circumvent their business models. As a result, the game's developer, Epic Games, filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, arguing its app store is a monopoly. Hi, I'm Kaiju, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm here to talk about adult games. I run a interview and streaming and awareness project based around the work of queer game developers called the Digital Diversity Project. The first one that I encountered along that lines was Hardcoded which is a quite well-known slice-of-life visual novel kind of simulator around a very heavily trans community with a lot of identity and a lot of sex. The society being what it is, I can't stream any of these games uh, because of their, their content, because sexualized content is banned on most platforms and any platform where I would attempt to get some kind of leverage to promote these games and their developers, they don't exist. So instead I focused on interviewing them and talking to them and finding out what made them want to write these. So this was a fascinating case that has the potential to impact literally billions of iPhone users. I think people should be allowed to see what an artist or a writer or an actor wants to do. It is creating something. Well, because it's ludicrous to have one man sitting in an office saying, um, you know, what you should see and what you shouldn't. It is the only app store that's allowed on the iPhone. Think of your Mac or PC desktop where you can install a number of different stores. If you want to play video games, you can install Steam. Uh, you do have the Apple App Store and a ton of 
other options. We also learned uh, that the company is uh, pretty concerned about what's happening in Europe with very similar allegations by EU regulators that Apple is running a monopoly on Apple Music and the App Store. That's really interesting because I don't know how many people kind of are aware that the, you know, the, the app store in Europe or even in Canada, it's a di completely different app store with different apps available. Sometimes the apps that you download here in the U.S. don't work when you go to other countries. To mark this dramatic occasion, members of the Lord Chamberlain's staff, having put down their blue pencils for the last time, have been to the theatre themselves to see the current revival of the show that started it all, The Beggar's Opera. It was in 1737 that Prime Minister Sir Robert Walpole instituted the Lord Chamberlain's Theatre of Powers after the biting satire aimed at the government which the show contained. Today's version was one of the very last scripts to pass through his Lordship's office. Tomorrow, Hair, the hippie musical from America, starts its run at the Shaftesbury Theatre. In one scene, men and women in the cast appear on the stage naked. Will this sort of thing be the first post-Lord Chamberlain trend? The director of Hair is Mr. Tom O'Horgan. Look, Apple has had a fairly pristine brand over the last um, decade or so, uh, especially when you look at it relative to their competitors, Facebook, Google, um, and others. So this could be something, it could be part of Epic's strategy to kind of scuff up Apple's brand a little bit. Uh, so even if the uh, lawsuit doesn't rule in favor of Epic, it could be that they, air quotes, win by uh, kind of kicking uh, the uh, the two trillion dollar company in the shins hi i am kate purcell i'm technically a community manager by trade but um community management often overflows into a lot of other aspects and one of my major aspects was moderation so i ended up working very very closely with our company lawyer on everything from dnca takedowns to um fbi requests to uh you know, all of the, we are not going to decide if anything is art or is not art, but uh, this is what we consider to be porn, and does this piece cross the line? <laughs> when I started at DeviantArt, uh, there was no place where you could really go and understand that I'm going to go to this place to find fandom content, but there's also hardcore pornography on this site, and that's okay. Right. It was very segmented, like it was very difficult to even find. I like Final Fantasy and I like Breath of Fire. It was very rare to find a site that had both Final Fantasy and Breath of Fire fan art hosted together. So people's understanding of, of the Internet back then was very different. If I see porn on this site, this is a porn site and there is nothing else here was very much the norm. You could be a winner in our $10,000 when I was that age, I didn't think about, for instance, sex. We did the same things, and let's admit it, we did the same things, but it was, uh, it was a secret. Uh, discuss it when we got back into the dormitories of the fraternities, didn't brag about it. Your mothers are out there watching. They're watching Roller Derby, and then they change the channel. And this is you guys on the floor. They say, oh boy, they're really sick. Those poor kids. I don't think any more is going on. I mean, you can only get to a certain point in sex and you can't go any farther, but I think it's just being brought out in the open more. People are talking about it. People are thinking about it. They're not sneaking off in corners and not telling their friends about it and being embarrassed about it. They're coming right out in the open. But sooner than you may think now, your child will be old enough for a full explanation. So let's brush up on it, you and I, and together review the human reproductive system. A model will help you review the fundamentals. The only index we have of this is what people say, and more people talk about what they do which might give the impression that people are freer, but personally, I don't believe that's the case. Yeah, I started playing like my first visual novels. I started playing like my first 
porn flash games when I was in my teens, when I was in high school. My name is Bella Blondo, and I'm a staff blogger for Notaku, and I'm here to talk about porn games. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to be looking at the stuff, but like, it was already out of the bottle. I couldn't put that back in, right? As I went into the game industry, I kind of took that interest and brought it into, into that workplace. So I would give coverage to adult games because that was just a part of the industry that I really cared about. First of all, there I think is this discomfort that people have that there are games that are just depicting sexual acts in a very blatant kind of way without any hint of subtlety, I guess. And in America, you know, especially where I grew up in the, in the deep south for a lot of my childhood, you know, that's the kind of stuff that people don't like looking at. It makes them uncomfortable on some innate level. The biggest impact on what is allowed, especially in America, especially when it comes to online content and also video games, is advertising. If an advertiser is not comfortable with their ads being on the same page as a female presenting nipple or a penis, that page is essentially costing you money as opposed to making you money. There's a type of censorship going on that is like a very polite censorship and it is a polite censorship in that you can't necessarily talk about porn games on IGN and keep all of your advertisers. You just you simply could not do that. And so that to me is a type of censorship because it puts adult gaming developer, like adult game developers at a disadvantage. The powers that be are not able to talk about these games because it then puts this entire industry in a box that is do not touch. We had rules around what the site allowed and what our advertisers were comfortable being on with. Those were often, we wanted to give artists more freedom than we generally could while also maintaining the site. As an example, there was this really, really amazing photograph. It was like a cliff and uh, a guy standing on the cliff. And it was like, I don't remember if it was a sunrise or a sunset, but it was a beautiful skyscape behind him. And he was just silhouetted and he had the biggest boner. It was just out there, but it was also silhouetted, um, but it was also very clearly an erection. And we had to have long discussions about what what do we do with this? Because technically, that's a problem. But also technically, if you go back to Greek myth, right, an erection was a border marker. That was, it's a way of displaying dominance. We spent a lot of time having to discern between like, is this person actually erect? Or given that they're like clearly involved in some sort of physical activity, is this increased blood flow? So what is Sesta Fosta? This is a piece of legislation that was signed into law by Donald Trump on April 11th, 2018. It is the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. It kind of converged into one piece of horrible legislation that has had all kinds of effects, um, resulting in 150 at least documented tech actions. Uh, this has involved Craigslist. If any of you have been trying to find a date on Craigslist, you probably have had some trouble. Uh, many other websites have also been shut down or censored. We're seeing an increased amount of shadow banning um, or outright removal of sex workers from services. So what is this? Essentially what this legislation did is it eliminated Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This means that websites are now um, have increased liability for any third party content that is posted. Uh, so even if a website doesn't know that someone may be buying or selling sex on their website, they are now uh, going to be in trouble for that. This means that there's increased scrutiny on speech online, and uh, it's had, as I said, tremendous effects. Honestly, I think the devs are scared about what's going to happen, especially for content like this. We've already seen it happen on multiple platforms. We've already seen sex workers' incomes get taken away entirely by payment processors who are at the pressure of credit card companies and advertisers refuse to handle any business that is in the explicitly adult direction. Sex workers and especially queer sex workers were making waves about this well before Sesta Foster happened. And it's just been rolling since. Oh well. 
You probably won't find anything too incriminating, I hope. I made a game called Feast, which involves the consumption of actual food as part of the game, right? And, and I did that because I was interested in, uh, in my practice about the actions and verbs that players engage in when playing a game. In one sense, games can be defined as a medium in which players or participants need to take action in order to engage more than just like reading and watching or listening, right? They need to do things. And that made me think about, well, what other things can we use as verbs that would be interesting in games, right? And again, not just what verb is the game modeling, but what verbs are the players taking part in in order to play the game. I was talking to my friend who then became one of my co-editors, um, Lucian Khan, who was also an indie game designer in New York. And we had both come up with slightly saucy games separately, right? And we were like, you know what would be really cool is if we have like an anthology of saucy games. The idea of sexuality, especially queer sexuality in games, has been really interesting for a while. And it was, but this anthology that Lucian and I made together with these wonderful designers was kind of what crystallized that in a way. I mean, I started off with, like, interactive fiction a lot in general. That was, like, what I found most cool, like, games that could tell stories. And obviously there was a lot of adult games out there as well. But, like, even when they were, like, niche enough to appeal to me, they were often, like, they were not openly queer. And there was also a general don't ask, don't tell approach to sexuality in those games. Like everyone's anonymous and people can just be a shitlord because that's just how adult stuff is supposed to be according to some people. So I'm like not inherently interested in sex scenes as such, more like niche kink content. But I still feel like writing it is interesting because there is the way that games approach it varies a lot. Like a lot of games nowadays will have an option to say, do you want to have sex? Yes or no? Like to sort of give players an out. One issue I've got is that choosing not to have sex with someone means avoiding intimacy or avoiding, like, general game content. Like, even if that stuff is entirely just off-screen. So what I try to do with my new game is, like, also have some dialogues for if you choose not to have sex, that's just still vaguely intimate, I guess. Also, I really wanted to have a scene where you, like, negotiate what sex acts to actually do, because games are generally structured around the player, but there was a talk by Magna Giant, and it talked about how giving NPCs their own goals outside of what the player's own goals are, like, it helps those NPCs feel more fleshed out. So by giving, like, the player the option to, like, suggest certain acts that the other partner is not interested in, and, like, won't partake in, I feel like that gives them more agency influential games in that have made me think about you know games and sex and depictions of sex in general are um just a little loving which is by tk edland and hannah grasmo which is a large-scale nordic larp it's a five-day larp about um queer people during the early years of the hiv aids epidemic in new york it's a very heavy sort of game but characters have sex a lot. Players do not have sex. In fact, there's a rule in doing the game, players do not have any sex, but characters do in their representational ways. But one of the things that happens is after every sex scene, the players stand back to back and each monologue the thoughts that are going through their head um, post-coitus, let's say, right? And that's very interesting because that then emphasizes not necessarily just the act of sex, which is important in a game about HIV AIDS, but also like what are the power dynamics, reasons, those kinds of things, like why do people have sex, right? And it was really interesting because of the character design, like there are characters who have sex for lots of different reasons. I definitely check out Robert Yang's work. Robert Yang always makes these small 
very thoughtful games that explore a facet of sexuality, gay men sexuality. I think the first game that got banned was my dick pic game called Cobra Club. And in that game, it is a dick pic photo studio where you take pictures and send those pictures to people who want them. So although it is a dick pic game, it's more of like a, it's a consensual dick pic game. It's a dick pic utopia. And that game got banned from platforms like Twitch, uh, possibly the most popular streaming platform for games. And that's kind of messed up because my games are designed first and foremost as maybe like conversation pieces. And when when these games are not allowed on that platform, the first and foremost platform for video game culture and discussion, uh, it kind of uh, robs them of a lot of power and audience. And um, so then I thought, oh, okay, so may the problem is genitalia so maybe i just shouldn't show genitalia in my games so then uh, in my next game uh rinse and repeat that's a shower simulator game uh, i actually made a point of censoring the genital area and obscuring and pixelating it um and then that game also got banned even though i thought i was doing what they wanted so then i said okay fine i was just kind of like upset with guessing what this faceless corporation wanted from me. Um, and by the way, when they ban my games, they don't say anything about why it was banned or what I should be doing. There's zero communication. And if you email them, they also won't even say anything. They also just say, uh, please refer to our policy, bye. You know, there's zero communication because I'm not a huge company that controls a lot of market share and controls their audience. Um, I'm just some random guy making these games about gay culture. So as far as they're concerned, I don't even exist. I'm not even worth talking to. Um, so then for my next game, The Tea Room, I thought, okay, fine. I'll have zero <laughs> nudity and what genitalia there are, they will be replaced with the most acceptable object in all of video games, which are guns. So I replaced all the genitalia with guns. And to my knowledge, this game has not been banned because when you are um, sucking off a gun, there's nothing objectionable about that. Um, it's you're just cleaning another guy's gun and it's fun. The customers pay for the software up front and they can choose from tons of hot packages. Look at this. Oh, like I'm going to read every one. I'd be here till Bewitched came back to prime time. Come on. Apple and Google also have policies against sexual content and free expression on these platforms. Apple specifically argues that apps are not art. If you want to write about sex, write a book. If you want to talk about sex, record like a podcast or something. Do not do it in an app. An app is not art app is not a form of speech or expression therefore it can be strictly controlled uh, if i put all my time and energy into making an iphone game and then apple just says oh yeah we're never letting you put this on anyone's iphone ever then i've wasted all my time i've wasted all the my resources and energy in doing that so there's a huge sunk cost into engineering any of these apps so if you're not sure whether Apple will accept it or not, you can't feasibly put all that time into it. It is cyclical. First it was like gay writers, then it was newspapers. Newspapers were gonna destroy all of us. Then it was the radio. The radio was gonna corrupt all of us. Then it was comic books, and comic books were evil and was gonna corrupt our youth. And then it was TV because radio was losing their foothold, so they had to attack TV. And now it's video games. It is absolutely cyclical. Then you start walking into really questionable territory of what is an unacceptable game. Is, is this game that talks about sexuality unacceptable? 
we see that happening in the adult industry everywhere. Like uh, the porn laws in the UK were particularly um, well talked about for quite a while. You know, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. So it's just like, who who makes these decisions about, yes, you can do this, but no, you can't do this until you end up in a very puritanical, cis heteronormative situation where any game that isn't just a cis man and a cis woman being heterosexual together is is unspeakable. It is definitely easier and more acceptable to make games about queer content, about sex, and about sexual queer content than it was, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. The needle is moving. It's moving so much faster than I even thought it ever would, but that doesn't mean that it is easy for anyone involved in the space. I, I don't know. I bounce a lot between a pessimistic mood and a positive mood, as you know, I imagine many of us do all the time. Um, I think currently I'm in a pessimistic mood, <laughs> unfortunately, um, where I just feel like the forces of evil are winning, where the forces of censorship and oppression and anti-sex puritanical oppression, they, they, have, they just have their shit together and they are pushing on all the different pressure points of tech capitalism to get them to close in on all the walls on us. Um, anyone who wants to do any type of sexual uh, expression on almost any platform, you know, not just my struggles with uh, Twitch or Apple. You know, it's hard to feel like um, artists and sex workers and all these people I find solidarity with, it's hard to feel like we have a lot of power or influence on these platforms, right? I think that the current landscape is going to open people's minds in ways that we hadn't thought before. I think the last five years alone have been hugely influential on our understandings of sexuality and gender. And I think that in those few years, we've got a lot more people coming to terms with that side of their identity. And I think the development of platforms and media that allows people to experiment is going to widen things even more. As someone who kind of came into making sexual content and sexual art uh, more recently, it's realizing that, oh, this war has been raging on for like a really long time. And, oh, we lost a battle a long time ago. And then those consequences are still being felt. What you have just seen is not the worst material available. And yet, even this required editing to make it suitable to be shown in this film. I can only imagine like a new generation of like artists uh, and queer people suddenly joining this conversation and discourse and realizing, oh shit, we lost that battle like a million years ago. Oh my God, what is happening now? I certainly feel a deeper connection to history once I realize how long this like oppression and culture war has been going on. I think it's so important to continue because, you know, I believe we need to normalize conversations about sex and sexuality and culture anyway, and as games are just another art form within the broader um, space of culture, it needs to permeate that field as well. You have like this growing, burgeoning community of people who are on Twitter, in public, some people with the real names going, hey, I'm not embarrassed that I'm playing this. I enjoyed this. Let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to share this. And I want people when they play these games to go, yeah, I played this. Here's what I think about it. Because if you do that, you break the stigma surrounding sex games. You break the stigma surrounding sex. I sure as hell know that talking to people after I've talked about certain adult games I'm passionate about has changed their way of thinking. And when their way of thinking changes, they talk to other people and their way of thinking changes and it goes on and on. That in itself is changing people's lives. And that makes me hopeful there is a future for these games, that there is a future for the people who make them but we might just have to change our perceptions of what sustainable art creation is like.